I'm speaking with John Wesley Wright, who has performed many, many times in Dayton, former Daytonian, uh, now living in Maryland and teaching at um, Salisbury State University. Uh, many people, John, here in Dayton, uh, remember your Dayton residence fondly and all the wonderful performances you gave. And I'm sure lots of people would love to know what you've been up to since you left Dayton, but also, of course, as well, how you're doing uh, in this virus time. Well, Neil, first of all, uh, I just want to say, Dayton, hello. I, I love you. I remember you, of course. Uh, I, you know, come to the area as often as, as possible and uh, welcome any opportunity to come back and perform. Uh, it, it's Dayton and the area, you know, those are my roots. Those are the, the it's the place where I, I got my foundation for teaching, for performing. So I can't, uh, you know, it's part of me. So you're there. Uh, how am I doing in all of this uh, pandemic stuff? You know, I believe like everyone, uh, I there were a few weeks there where I was in a funk and, you know, uh, trying to be there for my students and trying to figure out, you know, what, what to make sense of it all. And after, uh, you know, catching up on every, uh, you know, series that I hadn't been able to see in the last, <laughs> you know, five years, I, uh, I suddenly began to realize, uh, you know, you got to get up and, and, and figure this out. So, so I too have gone towards making more virtual recordings and, in fact, just came back from uh, doing a professional recording in a studio outside of DC uh, with my guitarist. I, I don't know that you know this, but I have a, a guitar duo that is called North Meets South. And uh, we uh, have been performing together off and on for 10 years and decided that the, it, the pandemic was the time to get some good promo material and and get get going oh that's great i will i will look forward to to hearing and hopefully seeing that and um just in terms so we can place everything properly sure. geographically in the duo are you north or are you south <laughs> <laughs> well that is that that's a very good question so uh, or do, or uh, do you or do you change roles depending on on the circumstances well, if if you're if you're speaking if if we're speaking uh, geographically, I always have to stand to the guitarist's left. So uh, it depends on where we are, you know, <laughs> whether in, in, in geographically speaking, you're talking, you know, whether I'm the north or the south. But uh, practically speaking, I am from uh, a nat a native Roman from Rome, Georgia. And uh, Daniel Cumming is my guitarist, and she is a Torontonian. All right, so so at least in the broader shape of things, she, yes. she would be she would represent the North, and you would you would represent the South. All right, exactly. have, have that have that sorted out. So, John, um, sort of looking back over the years and all the many different performances that you gave in Dayton, uh, many with the Dayton Philharmonic, with the Bach Society at the University of Dayton when you were teaching there. One of the things that um, always struck me about you, besides what a nice guy you are and what a um, absolutely killer Scrabble player you are, um, was and how- And tennis, yes, but though I don't really do the tennis thing, was how wide your repertoire is. You have, you have performed at the Philharmonic, you have performed Monteverdi, you've performed as the, uh, as the evangelist in both of our performances of Bach Passions. You were, of course, the celebrant in the Bernstein Mass, which is the, the, the excuse that we have for getting together here. Um, you've sung spirituals, you've sung gospel, you've sung, you know, you name it, John Wright has, has <laughs> sung it. So what is it, I mean, do you, is it something about your makeup and how 
eclectic and broad your tastes are? Is it, you know, what, what is it that makes you not be a specialist and try, <laughs> try different things? But besides the fact that you do everything well, which is a good excuse to do a little of everything. Well, thank, thank you, Neil. Um, you, yeah, you just uh, evoked a, I believe I, I gave an interview once and uh, the, the, the question was similar to your question and I believe I answered it. I am a, a specialist in not being a specialist. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, this journey called, uh, you know, vocal performance, vocal discovery uh, is unique to everyone. And one of the things that, that I discovered about myself uh, was that I had to, to, to stop trying to fit into someone else's box. Mm -hmm. I had to stop trying to fit into someone else's idea of what success was. Um, and uh, there are a couple of I, I guess a couple of significant things happened along the way, uh, career-wise. Uh, one was being introduced to uh, a lady who was the bass in Sweet Honey in the Rock. Her name was uh, is Issei Barnwell. Just mm -hmm. recently had dinner with her uh, after the recording in D.C. And uh, she was a, a judge for a competition uh, in Savannah, Georgia called the American Traditions Competition. And the American, it's, it's still going on, uh, except for the, in my day, back in the day. Uh, yeah, we're old enough we get to say that now. <laughs> yes, we're old enough that we can say that now. They have, uh, currently they have uh, different categories. So if you are more of a folk singer, uh, or if you're more of a Broadway singer, or you, if you're more of a classical singer, those categories are, are all separated. But at, for the longest time, for the first, uh, I would say probably decade or, or longer, uh, that the you know, competition, in the existence of the competition, you were required to do all of that. And, oh, and, and, wow. so, and so Dr. Barnwell knew this about me she 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 was like you need to you know stop this nonsense and go down there and and win that competition you need to go down to do that competition you you'll get to do everything you're good at i mean you so you had to create three programs and uh and i'm under the umbrella uh of i mean i mean under that umbrella i had you know, jazz, gospel, American folk song, Broadway, uh, American art song. I had an aria from Barbara's Vanessa. I mean, you name it. And uh, and so that was that was a significant thing. I actually ended up winning that competition in in two thousand and in, in the year two thousand. So uh, it was a wake up call that. Uh, to embrace everything that, that I could possibly embrace. And I, could, I, I couldn't imagine anybody beating you out because you, you can really do it all and do it all beautifully. Now we will get to talking about mass, but since we're talking about broad repertoire and we sure. were talking about your students, there is one slightly thorny subject that I wanted to discuss with you because I think you're the perfect, <laughs> perfect person to discuss it with. As I recall, when you were teaching on the, the voice faculty at UD, one of the sort of philosophies of your, of your teaching studio was that you used African-American spirituals as part of everyone's singing repertoire. It wasn't yes. just for African-Americans. It, it was for everybody. You, you believed that that this was music that everybody should sing and everybody should learn to sing and everybody should feel comfortable singing. And I, I remember hearing just in, in student recitals and, and things, uh, just some incredible performances of spiritual repertoire um, in different characters, depending on the, you know, who the, who the singer was. And um, I would imagine that in today's climate, that's that perhaps puts you a little bit 
on the edge of of what a lot of people believe. And I did, I remember hearing a little bit that you caused a little bit of a ruckus. So could, <laughs> can, can you bring us up to speed a little bit about the ruckus and, and just uh, about your philosophy about where spirituals fit in, in musical performance? Oh my, uh, are, you, are, are you auditioning for, uh, you know, CNN or something? <laughs> No, this is, uh... this is this is not my white, my Mike Wallace, yeah, it, yeah thing. There isn't uh, there isn't going to be a surprise person walking onto your porch uh, <laughs> to uh, to confront you with anything. I promise. Okay, great. Yes. So, um, just this winter, in fact, uh, which was a, a wonderful, a, a rich winter in terms of. Uh, performing and lecturing and teaching. And one of the experiences I had, I was a, an artist in residence at Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo. And um, just, to, you know, one of the, one of the blessings of, of being able to be eclectic is uh, I, I can go into situations like I did in Kalamazoo and serve many roles. So the very first thing I did was judge a, a concerto aria competition. So, so that was how my week started out was judging, uh, giving a master class with all the vocal students with all kinds of repertoire from you know, Peter Grimes to, you know, spirituals, et cetera, and then judging, um, judging a, a concerto aria competition. Well, the, as the, the week progressed and I um, uh, gave various workshops on uh, singing in African-American traditions, uh, it, this culminated in a, uh, in a concert that involved choirs and uh, young soloists and faculty soloists. And uh, it was just a beautiful time. I mean, it was the, the African-American music uh, students particularly uh, said, you know, to me that, you know, they felt often disenfranchised, that, that they felt finally like there was something, that this was something for them. And, 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 and then the, and the, the non-African-American uh, students realized that, uh, you know, that this, this, the importance of the history and, and to contextualize it and that they also had a responsibility for performing uh, spirituals and understanding the context of spirituals. So that the experience uh, was 99.9999% amazing. And, uh, and I would welcome going back there anytime. There was one snag after it was all over, actually literally the, the night before getting on the plane to go to the next gig. And, uh, and I got, get this phone call and the, um, gentleman who uh, was my host, he said, you know, uh, hi, John, I, I don't think this is going to be an issue, uh, but we've had, uh, you know, something happen. Apparently, there was a young lady in the audience who, uh, who videotaped you and tweeted out something that to the effect of, you know, look at these people and they shouldn't be singing our music and, and you know, this man is, you know, doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and there, but the, but what really struck me the what sh the core of all of that was the, the call out cultural part, if you will, mm -hmm. was the, was the part about uh, these white people shouldn't be singing our music. And, right. and that was, that was the part that, uh, you know, that, that made people nervous and made, made folks that were not anywhere near the performance uh, respond. And, it, and, it, and it, it, over a couple of days, um, went viral. Her, her tweet went viral and I believe got picked up on, you know, like a BET website and, 
and other websites and 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 so I started to get phone calls from everywhere journalists and and uh, I, I it, it was really the first first experience and hopefully the last uh, uh, that I ever had like it a little a little social media storm well you know as as you were as you were describing the the activities that you did in Kalamazoo I mean I I can intellectually I can see both sides of it but you right. know you you were approaching sounds to me like you were approaching spirituals the way you might approach romantic german art song or french french art, art songs in the sense that a that a singer studies studies a, a repertoire of music finds finds uh, songs that that appeal to them learns the context learns the style and then presents it as part of their repertoire of singing and and you don't have to be a german to sing schumann and you don't have to be french to sing du parc um, well, but but there is this this sensitivity if the music that you're that you're performing is music from the from the black tradition and you and you don't have that in your in your personal cultural heritage so i i can see it both ways but i think you know in the same way that that the music of these various national styles has become to a certain extent everybody's music um you know i can, uh, I can i'll just see, yeah i'm I'll digging just, myself I'll, in a hole here but you, maybe you can pull me out i'm gonna i'm going to nip i'm gonna pull you out of that hole and 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 nip nip all of this in the bud which is what should have happened there right and, and, uh so what you're describing is uh a, is is a slope that we really don't want to go down we mm. it's it's just a very it's it's a it's a rabbit hole that we just do not want to go down uh would i have to take all the schubert out of my repertoire because i am african-american and not austrian uh so it's a it's a it's a, i think a very dangerous uh a, a dangerous road to to go down and um there there are th some things culturally uh as the spiritual and and all the other the, the african-american spiritual is a genre and should be respected as such and there are genres that came before it the the ring shout the field holler and when you put all of those things and you really look at it you see how how integrated into our pop culture and 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 otherwise that these songs are they show up uh, in commercials they show up in pop music they show they show up everywhere and so there is no turning back in my opinion there is no turning back down the road of oh wait maybe we shouldn't do this. It's so far, you know, it's, it's so far down the road. It's, it's just, it, we, we have to embrace it. We have to celebrate it and we have to look at it as, as everyone's music. Let's talk about Bernstein's mass. Cause that's ostens <laughs> ostensibly why we're here though. I, I could talk to you about all kinds of stuff all afternoon. Um, we're, we're coming up on, well, it's just over nine years since we performed Bernstein's Mass here in Dayton uh, with the Dayton Philharmonic and you and uh, a whole slew of students from Wright State's music and dance and, uh, and theater departments. And uh, <clears throat> we see the really cool uh, Bernstein's Mass poster behind you, which you assured me <clears throat> always hangs there. It was not just put there specifically for this, uh, for nope. this Zoom, Zoom recording. Um, <clears throat> so I've been doing and preparing for, for this, uh, this broadcast or this rebroadcast of the performance. I obviously have been doing a lot of thinking and reminiscing uh, about those performances. So uh, let me just start. I mean, I know mass was an important thing for you. I know you did your doctoral presentation about the role of the celebrant after having performed it here in Dayton. Uh, so looking back at it from almost 10 years ago, um, what are your impressions of, 
of having performed as the celebrant in mass? You know, sometimes people's dreams become your dream. And that's just, I would have to say the case with, with you, Neil, your dream became my dream. I was you know, honored to be, to audition and to be asked to do the role uh, of the celebrant. I had, um, I, I too, uh, you know, knowing that I was going to speak with you today, went back and, and, and looked, <laughs> looked at my lecture and my documents uh, on, on the work. And uh, it, it's, I mean, it is, it's so it's so sentimental and it's uh it's it brings up so many um you know emotions and uh it was it was definitely a time um i i i I actually can't think of anything that had a bigger impact uh the stars aligned in so many ways doing that role um i I knew exactly what I wanted to write about. I had gone for over a couple of decades without finishing my doctorate. And when I had the experience of, of singing, uh, you know, the celebrant, performing the celebrant role, uh, I was like, this is it. This is it. Um, you know, it's interesting from a, from a technical standpoint, uh, one of the things that I did, and it's one of the other, um, interviews that's or discussions that uh, people can can watch up on the website is I did a, a couple of weeks ago I talked to John Mauchery who was the conductor yeah. of the Yale Symphony when I pre, um, performed in the orchestra for that and John had a almost a 20-year uh, working relationship with Leonard Bernstein that started with that production of Mass uh, in New Haven in 1973. And um, one of the things that John said, which I hadn't thought about before, but I know I did subliminally think about it when, when I was thinking of you as a, okay. a possible person for the role, is that the role of the celebrant vocally from a technical standpoint is, it's a very strange role. Uh, and what John well, the way John phrased it, which I'd never thought of before, is it's exactly the same as Tony in West Side Story. <laughs> it's, it's essentially a baritone role, but it has all these tenor notes in it. Exactly. Uh, and, you know, now in the era of, for better or for worse, the era of Phantom of the Opera, that is now a voice. You know, there are there are people, you know, because that's essentially the, the main male role in, in Phantom of the Opera and so many other Broadway shows is the sort of baritoner uh, who goes both very high and very low in the register. Right. Uh, but, in you know, in 1954 with West Side Story, that specialty hadn't really um, appeared before. And uh, even now, if, especially if you think about people from the, the classical side of the, the, the fence, so to speak. Um, it is still, you know, not everybody has the voice that you have that has, that is definitely a tenor, but you have a little, a baritone <laughs> supplement down there that you can, that you can get into. And it's one voice that goes from the baritone, the traditional baritone register up to the top of the, of the tenor register, which is of course exactly what Bernstein wanted, even though it didn't quite exist yet. Um, so, you know, I always thought John would be the perfect celebrant and, and it turned out, but, but as the singer, how do you, how do you deal with that, the, the complexities that, that Bernstein creates for you? I would say for, for me, uh, it, it's, it is definitely, it's why roles are written for specific people, right? I mean, uh, you, you see, you see it in, in, uh, in classical music, it, when you think more about, uh, you know, specific female roles where, that have really high extensions or, and, and it was, you know, written for a specific 
specific person because their voice could just do that. Right. I mean, Mozart, Mozart didn't write the Queen of the Night for a generic soprano. A exactly. He had, he had a particular singer in mind when, Absolutely. He wrote, when he wrote that. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, yeah, you know, the, the role of the celebrant actually uh, made me feel a little bit like, oh, eclecticism, uh, stylistic variation, uh, range variation, I, I'm right at home. So, uh, I, and, and it, it is strange because, you know, you, you, if, you, if, the, if the voice in, in the role of the celebrant is too heavy, you lose a lot of the lightness uh, and the tenderness that is required. Uh, but then at the same time, if you're in your in the lower part of the celebrant's uh, range, uh, and you want some warmth and and some and some color, so I I was uh, you know they you see what's on the page and you you know you see it is it's sometimes a challenge um, on both ends, but uh, in this case it was it was a welcome welcome challenge. And uh, also on the technical side, and it fits into the same thing, one of, I think, one of the interesting things about mass, and literally I hadn't really thought of this point until just this second, okay. is, is the fact that you have 1973, that is just the beginning of starting to have wireless microphones. Uh, because mass, mass was conceived because it's got a rock band, it has a blues band, it has right. electronic stuff. Uh, the singing was designed to be amplified. And I know at, um, in the production at Yale, that was one of the complications. They had some, some area microphones to pick up the members of the street chorus and also to pick up the, the big stand and, or stand and sing chorus in the back. Um, and there were, then there were also microphones on stands that solo singers would pick up and hold in their hand as they did their solo numbers. And the celebrant had one of these newfangled, you know, body mic with a radio, yes. you know, with a battery pack on it. And in fact, in one of the performances uh, during the summer, when we went to Vienna to do the, the four performances that were the, the European premiere, there was one performance when the, the celebrant, something went wrong with the battery pack on the celebrant's um, microphone. Oh, and, wow. and the orchestra repeated the second meditation. We played it again after it, you know, John said, play the second meditation. And, you know, the, the celebrant sort of went into one of his meditative poses and a stagehand came out and I assume swapped out the battery. You know, so I'm sitting there in the pit playing, but I'm also looking up on stage following what's, uh, what's going on. And of course, when you think of the male roles that you have, well, probably all the roles that you have in Broadway now, those were all predicated on people having a body mic. Um, and so that enables them to finesse some of the vocal challenges because you're not singing for the back of the house, you're singing for the microphone that's, that's attached somewhere on your, your costume or your face. But you know, not to sort of pile the praise on to you, I mean, I, I think if you had to sing the celebrant role on a night when there was no microphone, I think as long as the conductor was keeping the orchestra soft enough, you know, you, you have that range without the assistance of the, of the microphone, which is something. I, that I, I will does. gladly, I will gladly take the take microphone. That challenge. <laughs> oh, yes. right. Yes. I mean, cause it, it was designed for that. It's designed for that. Um, I actually, uh, Neil had, had a similar experience, uh, with Les Mis, uh, the, the same type of ex experience that you described uh, was on stage and um, you know doing Jean Valjean and oh and the uh, mic and the mic went out yes yes and and the you know the that's a it's the same type of range rangy uh role uh awkward for tenor a little bit low for the tenor but have to have high high notes as well and uh yeah my, the, the mic 
batteries went out. And, and so off as I could until I had my, you know, next exit and switch it out. But it's, uh, it's definitely meant for that. And, uh, and that's, that's all right. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. And, and I suppose, you know, that was also one of the things that made mass perhaps a little controversial at the time, because amplified singing in the concert hall was not something that really anybody had experienced much at all. And it was, I think, probably just another one of those just weird, crazy things about this piece that kind of pushed, pushed some people's buttons in a, in a little, little bit of a way. Um, another question about the role of the celebrant uh, and maybe some of the, some of the lessons you put to use in your, in your doctoral dissertation. Right. Um, but, you know, the, for, you know, there are some people who may be listening to this before they, they actually hear the broadcast. One of the sort of interesting and challenging things about Mass is that despite its title, it is not really a Mass in the same way that the Bach B minor Mass is or the Schubert Mass in G or, the, right. or, uh, or any of the other Masses of the concert repertoire. It really is a Broadway show. It's a theater piece. He calls it a theater piece for singers, dancers, and actors. And it's basically the story of a person, which is you, the celebrant, the main character in the, in the story, a person who has power and responsibility thrust on them by just circumstance. And then acquires power and wields power and then people revolt against his power and then in the end they have a sort of they come to a to a moment of peace as as John Maturi says it's it's about the rise and fall and sort of return of a leader uh and that's a big that's a big responsibility uh to put on on you as an actor so how did how did you how did you approach having all that responsibility piled on you in the same way that it gets piled on the celebrant? Like most people, the, you know, the, the, the one that the one hit that we know from mass uh, that we don't, people don't really even realize is from mass is a simple song. Right. And so for, you know, for years in, in college and, you know, church services, and you know, that was the, the piece that I sang, and that, that's what people associated, you know, with, with Mass, or if, if they, they didn't even know that it was from Mass, that's the piece that they knew. And so when I, uh, you know, when you first broached the subject of, of the celebrant, and, you know, looking through the score, and I saw this, you know, 17 minute um, mad scene, mad scene break, breakdown. I, I thought, you know, this is just too cool for words. I mean, I, I have always been uh, approached uh, singing, my singing career in a little a different way. Uh, my cognate in my doctoral program was acting. So uh, in fact, I had to get approval to have my cognate be acting uh it's it it's kind of sounds silly right i mean but most people you know they chose as their their minor or cognate in that in the graduate program would be either vocal pedagogy or opera directing um but i i saw my you know i saw the benefits of being in class with the straight, the, the straight up act, you know, actors, uh, the folks majoring in drama. And so I spent two years uh, doing that. And so it was a beautiful thing to be able to truly, you know, to, to use those, those, t those tools. And it's, it's an interesting thing about mass, the way it's constructed is that there are many, many roles in the piece. 
at, which is one reason why it's great for a university situation. Uh, yes. Many, many individual solos for singers. And each person who's in the cast in the what's called the street chorus in the I mean, the structure of the piece for, for those who don't know it is there's the celebrant who's you the main character. There's the street chorus, which is this group of singing, dancing actors who sort of represent just everyday people. Yep. There's a there's a sort of traditional stand in one place and sing chorus, uh, which um, which is sort of in the back of things, the kind of traditional chorus that you think of as being in a mass setting. Uh, and then there's and then there are dancers as well. But each of the people in in the street chorus, you know, in our production, they were each an individual person. And Absolutely. Greg Hellams, our director, you know, he started off by having them take some time to create the backstory of who their character is. Uh, and many of them have a solo moment when they get to speak who they are musically. Um, but then they go back into the, 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 the core, the chorus, is it the street chorus, and they just become one of, one of many people. So whereas you are essentially on stage almost the entire evening, and you right. are always the, in some ways, the focus of attention. It's the story is all about you. So it's an interesting dichotomy. You have one character who is right at the center of the focus. And then you have this large group of other people who have their moment in the sun and then they, and then they become part of, part of the, the larger cast. And again, it puts a, it puts a big responsibility on you in terms of carrying you know, each of the each of the street chorus soloists has their moment to create their story, but you are you are the story which connects everything, and which brings all of those little stories into a single focus in the piece. So, one of the things you'll you'll I'm sure agree with me when you see. Uh, you know, a great, um, a great piece of art, uh, whether it's on, on the film screen or on the stage, is the art of listening uh, and uh, the art of observing. And so that is a huge part of, of an actor's skill set. And, and so those, those were the moment the moments where uh you know that responsibility of the leader is not so much in what they are saying or it's more in what they're not saying and uh and the, those were actually some of my favorite moments i i i, would, I have so many fav favorite moments and memories from the show one was in uh, inter an in interaction uh that actually was motivic in a way it it had um there was a, a sort of sort re of recurring uh theme uh movement that i had with a particular dancer uh during the meditations and that was one of the ways that uh the choreographer gina uh, walter uh was you know so brilliantly con connected things together uh that there was a, almost this dancer was reflecting the thoughts of the celebrant. Right. And it was one, it was one dancer who was, one, a, who was in effect the celebrant of the dancers. Exactly. Your, your exactly. alter ego. Right. Yeah. And, and coming from a, a dance background myself as well, you know, spending years in, in undergrad school in the Appalachian Ballet and, and revisiting, it, it really was a role that allowed me to revisit uh, a lot of things, my both my dance uh, background and my acting training in school, and so I can't thank you enough. And I'm ready for the 50th anniversary <laughs> uh, re revisit. Well, it's like you know, there's the there's the senior tour in golf. There should be a senior tour in mass, where where conductors and and singers and dancers and actors who've who've done the role in their youth can come back and and uh, the Absolutely. Mass, the, the master's version of that. <laughs> Absolutely. 
the legends version the Are legends you yeah that's that's even more classy john thank you so much it's been just a treat to talk to you and and fun to reminisce about mass but also speak about other things um i hope it will be very soon that we can uh get back to performing and uh we'll i'll we'll figure out a way to get you back in dayton and back on the stage of the schuster center again because uh, you're one of my favorite collaborators, and I know you have a lot of fans in Dayton who will be happy to see you here, but even happier when they can see you perform in person. Well, thank you, Neil. It's been a, a wonderful uh, friendship and music making time with you. All of this, all of these, now we can say decades, my goodness. Right. So thank you so much, Neil. Thank you.